Welcome. This is Symposium 3. The title is Intelligent Navy and Validity in National and International Multi-Database Pharmacoepidemiologic Studies, Lessons Learned in North America, Europe, and Asia. So thanks for staying. This is a long day and this is the last session. This, um, you have uh, maybe 90 minutes to go and hopefully this is going to be a um, meaningful session to you. So what we're talking today is about multinational databases and then heterogeneity. So in Asia, large database is not yet universally available in all countries for research. However, I think you all agree that the database played really a pivotal role in terms of the development of science, of pharmacal epi, and then spread of the science. And then in, in many countries in Asia, we're recognizing that. Plus, there has been increasing awareness, oh, sorry, increasing advancement and adaptation of disruptive computer technologies. So really it's imperative that we're gonna have databases at some point in all probably countries. Multi-database pharmacoepidemiology studies employs a common data or common common data model or, or common protocol and in distributed network approach in general. And MPS, multi-database pharmacoepidemiology studies, can pull millions of subjects and produce more statistically robust results. So it's quite powerful, yet uh, that's not without the limitations. One of the topic, one of the issues that we're focusing today is this, the differences, heterogeneity. So databases are, could be quite different in nature, and therefore the results coming out of the database, each database it might be quite different. If the difference is something like um, carrot versus, um, let's say, tomato, it's really nothing wrong with it. And if you see differences in the disease prevalence, disease or drug utilization, that's kind of uh, the real data, and then it's just comparing the apple to orange, and that's what you have to accept. Whereas the heterogeneity that you're seeing is might be that you're, you are, you're supposed to see perfect apple, but in some databases that you're not seeing uh, normal apple, but it could be rotten apple, then that could be problematic. That kind of source could come from technical sort of uh, problems. Maybe you didn't convert the codes right, or maybe you didn't convert the model right, or you are comparing uh, different types of data sources. That differences could be also coming from the system or culture-based differences between the populations or countries or regions. So really this is something we're gonna talk today, and then kind of realizing that some heterogeneity could be clearly problematic in, in pharmacoepidemiology studies. So again, I would like you to keep in mind where the, sor the sources of heterogeneity as you hear the speakers about their experiences in, in kind of uh, dealing with heterogeneity. So uh, we're going to share, that like each speaker is going to share heterogeneity experiences uh, in multi-database pharmacoepidemiology studies in the US, Canada, Europe, and Asia. Uh, really the goal is to discuss when and how to aggregate the result from each database and conduct, uh, conclude the study appropriately, and then start really forming consensus on recommendations on the best practices to address measures and unmeasured heterogeneity across databases and populations. So without further ado, I'm going to call the first speaker, um, Dr. Darren To from uh, US. Good afternoon, my name is Darren Tao. I am uh, from Harvard Medical School and Harvard Human Healthcare Institute. Um, so I'm going to continue what uh, Dr. Brad has uh, started uh, in the last session about Sentinel. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, database heterogeneity. So just very quickly, um, Sentinel is um, a congressionally mandated uh, system, meaning that um, FDA was asked by the US government to stand up uh, an active civilian um, system to monitor the safety of medical products that the agency regulates. Um, so Sentinel started as um, a pilot called Mini Sentinel in 2009 and um, it was um, sort of 
upgraded or uh, it grew up to become the fully functional Sentinel in, in 2016. Um, so Sentinel uh, is a distributed data network in which um, we have 18 data contributing sites that uh, provide uh, electronic health data uh, either from um, transactions of insurance or uh, clinical care. So we are talking about electronic health care databases like insurance claims data or electronic health record uh, data. And we also have a network of uh, academic partners uh, who, uh, who provide uh, content uh, and methodological expertise. So I'm going to focus on how we design uh, the system to minimize um, exogenous uh, variability so that um, whenever we see something that is different across size, we'll be able to more confidently uh, attribute that to actual treatment effect heterogeneity by uh, data source. So I'm going to focus on uh, four uh, major things. Uh, one is uh, standardized data structure, uh, robust data quality assurance process, uh, the use of pre-tested uh, analytic tools uh, that can be queried against the common data structure, and the use of a standardized analytic plan that also have, uh, has a flexibility to allow site-specific analysis. So the first one, uh, standardized data structure. Um, so Sentinel standardize um, the data structure in advance before we do any analysis. So even though the databases are created by different organizations, if you look across or if you look deep, you'll be able to extract data elements that are co constant um, across the data partner. So that is the concept of a common data model. If you are able to extract the data and create a set of uh, standardized tables with a standardized definition for the covariance, that essentially uh, is a common data model. Um, so this is a Sentinel common data model. It's version control, uh, meaning that whenever there is a minor or major release, there is a change in the number. Um, so it is broken down into different data domains that some of you might actually be quite familiar with. Um, so we are mostly talking about insurance claims data here and there is also some uh, electronic health record information. Um, so we have enrollment information, so in a given time we know exactly how many people are contributing data to the Sentinel system, which is important because for a lot of analysis we need to know what the absolute incidence or incidence rate is. So to do that, you need to know your uh, denominator. And Sentinel is able to do that uh, to complement the spontaneous report system that FAA already has. Uh, and I'm not going to go over this. Uh, the, 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 the goal to show you here is that um, there is a standardized data tables that Sentinel is using um, across the data partners. And to sort of convert the source data into the Sentinel Common Data Model, we actually have to ask each data partner to do that themselves because the goal is for us at FDA to not have direct access to potentially sensitive data. So we actually have to have some sort of um, standard operating procedure that each data partner will follow um, to convert the data into a CDM. And, uh, most of the data partners convert the data or update the data every quarter and every quarter when they convert the data from the source data to the Sentinel Common Data Model we run through um, a pretty sophisticated um, set of data quality checks without actually uh, accessing the patient of the data. So some of you are aware of this um, uh, guidance um, that was issued by FDA. So basically it says if you want to do database analysis these are the several things that we have to follow. And uh, we compare what we do in Sentinel with what FDA recommended. Um, uh, we meet all the um, sort of suggestions, recommendation requirements, and in many cases, we exceed uh, the recommendation. So during each data refresh, for each data partner, we do more than 1,400 checks. So these are checks that are based on tables, figures, summary level information. So we do that within data partner, and we also do that across data partner to make sure that the data are of sufficient quality before we use them for any analysis. So this is a very quick example for one of the many uh, figures that we created. So this is to, uh, a figure that shows that there's a change in the, the number uh, between two refreshes. And whenever we identify things like this, we will go back to the data partner to figure out why. Sometimes there's a good reason for that, sometimes it's due to error in the conversion. So we do this check for all the variables in the common data model, and in total there are about 1,400 checks. 
Um, so after we have the common data model, um, to make the analysis more efficient and more standardized uh, and less variable, um, we develop a suite of analytic tools that can be queried against the common data model. So now that we know what the data looks like, it's easier for us to develop code that can be reused for different analysis. So if you are talking about cohort study, it follows a very sort of uh, standard workflow, if you will. Uh, the same is true for case control study and other type of study. So if you are able to sort of um, extract information that can be parameterized uh, in a given study, uh, you'll be able to create a skeleton or a structure that you can use over and over again. So this is an example um, using the ACE Individual and Enjoy Lima example. So this is what we do in a one-off study. So we write code based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria in the analysis plan. But if you think this through uh, more carefully, you'll be able to extract information that can be replaced from study to studies. Um, so um, in the end, it becomes some sort of fill in the blank uh, type of uh, exercise. I don't want to minimize the importance of having a pharmacoepidemiologist and a biostatistician on the team, but there are things that you can standardize and make um, sort of routine. Um, and uh, the other part will be more human driven. But we are trying to determine things that can be reused uh, versus things that will uh, require human interaction or uh, judgment for a given analysis. So this is uh, uh, an example of a proposed um, analysis in Sentinel. So we have two major analytic tools. When I say two, this is a just gigantic SaaS program that you can sort of uh, monetize. So we have a, a program that will create cohort based on your inclusion exclusion criteria, uh, and then the end product will be an analytic data set that will sit uh, with it, uh, behind the firewall of the data partner uh, and using another tool that can estimate the proposal and do matching and stratify uh, analysis on that, you'll be able to do the analysis that you want. And um, the way we do this is that we do as much as possible at the data partner side, and then what comes back to Sentinel operation sector uh, is usually uh, highly summarized. Um, so by doing this, um, we will be able to do the study or an analysis in a very standardized way across the 18 data partners in Sentinel. Um, so this is a workflow uh, that we use uh, on a daily basis. So FDA will ask a question, and then we will uh, look into the analytic code to see what we need to sort of specify or modify. And after we test it within our internal data source, we will then send it to all the data partners. Uh, and since, uh, if you remember, everyone has the same common uh, data model, the program can be run without major modification, and most of the time without any modification at the data partner size. And they have the flexibility and ability to review the request before um, they decide to run it uh, locally within, within their database and have a chance to review the output before they send it back to the operation center for final analysis and aggregation. Um, so even with this framework, you will be able to do something like high dimensional case score, and we also mentioned uh, machine learning in the prior section um, to allow more site-specific uh, covariant adjustment. So that is also being done in Sentinel. And what is important for us now for this discussion is that you can always specify, pre-specify whether you want to stratify on data partner or additional patient characteristics if you suspect that there might be a treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, so this is um, one of the few examples I'm going to use. So this was a like, study looking at anti hypertensive drug and angiolima. So these um, are the overall estimates based on 17 data partners. Um, and we also routinely break down the result by data source. Um, so this is a report that is freely available. So we look across and um, so this might be something that we will discuss. Um, how would you determine treatment effect heterogeneity when you have millions or tens of millions of people in your study, whatever uh, test you're going to do is probably going to be statistically significant, but whether it is uh, clinically meaningful uh, is another uh, thing that we might want to discuss. So in this study, we pull all the effect estimates across size, but if you look at the test for heterogeneity, uh, it's uh, statistically significant, which we indicated it might be variation across size, but we decided to pull the, uh, the results across size. 
Uh, this was a, this is another example that we did uh, looking at glycogen glucoside and severe, severe hypoglycemia. So the goal of showing you this is that we are able to do the sort of traditional uh, uh, investigator identified covariate adjustment uh, through propensical analysis, and we are also able to do uh, high dimension high dimension propensity score actually using code that the size don't have to uh, modify because. There is a piece of code that is available by the developers of the high dimension of this score, they were able to leverage. Um, so, this to show that we write uh, high dimension of this score as well. You are not able to see this, it's not by design. Uh, uh, the goal to show you uh, this slide is that, um, uh, again, it's the same theme here. We stratify the uh, analysis by data partner and by the analysis, so you will be able to see whether there is any heterogeneity by data source. Um, so this is just to show you that maybe uh, if you look um, very, very uh, closely, there might be some variation. Uh, but this is an unadjusted estimate and based on very small sample size, you can see the white confidence interval, or you might not be able to see it, you have to trust me for it. Um, but after adjustment and more standardized analysis, the variability is sort of decreased. So this is shown here on the uh, right hand corner of the table. Um, uh, the third example is looking at, uh, again, uh, using force plot to see whether there is some uh, hydrogen in my side. Um, I think you're going to see this uh, a, a couple of times in, in the other presentation as well. So just to close up, so these are um, what we did or do to minimize um, exogenous variability so that anything that we see left here, uh, if there is any heterogeneity, it could be due to actual heterogeneity by data source. Um, what I did not mention here is that we almost always um, do uh, stratified analysis by patient characteristics as well because for some of the data partners that we work with, we know that the patients look very different from one data source to another data source because we know that some health plan just serve older population, some health system just uh, serve younger or healthier populations. So we know this because we work with their partners, but we know that their patient characteristics are different. So we almost always also do pre-specified support analysis by uh, patient characteristics in addition to uh, data source. Um, so I talk about this. Um, so if you don't have the slides with you, uh, please do contact me. I'm happy to share the slides, uh, especially for the numbers that you are not able to see. So this is all I have. Thank you. Thanks again for the invitation. Um, you'll see that there's a there's a progression in the talks that we have in this session that we started from the most centrally organized group Sentinel, moving now to something slightly less centrally organized C nodes, and we're going to keep moving uh, further throughout this talks. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about CNOs, the Canadian Network for Observational Drug Effect Studies. You can think of CNOs as a little bit like Sentinel, but Canadian. Um, Dr. Hartson made some references to this to CNOs at Descent, which is the sort of parent organization that organizes CNOs. The same disclosures as before. Uh, the CNOs team, CNOs is funded by a grant from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. This is a little different from. Sentinel, which as Darren pointed out, is a contract with uh, the FDA. Uh, these are our investigators. Um, Sammy Suisa and I are the, the co-PIs and the coordinating center is at McGill in Montreal. Uh, so CNODES is, uh, we try to use population-based administrative healthcare data to provide timely responses to queries for Canadian public stakeholders regarding drug safety and effectiveness. A similar mandate to Sentinel, similar mandate to some of the other organizations we're going to hear about today. Uh, we typically work with a safety query that comes from a stakeholder. It's usually Health Canada. Um, it's sometimes um, other organizations, either within the provincial uh, drug funders or other organizations like the Health Technology Assessment uh, Unit as well. Um, there's protocol development and query refinement, statistical analysis plan development and testing, implementation, and then a meta-analysis. So similar to the kinds of stuff you saw from, from in Darren's presentation, the main difference is 
instead of using a common data model and automated algorithms here, we're working with the, the raw data in its raw format and new programs generated by analysts each time based on the statistical analysis button. This is a schematic, you probably can't see this very well, but basically we get a query from, from DSEN, the, the umbrella organization that sends us our queries, it comes to the coordinating center, our team, it's sent out to, or it's assigned to people across the country at each of the different sites. Um, then a protocol is developed, analyses are run, they're synthesized back at the coordinating center, and then reports come out, and then we respond to the query submitted. We use uh, seven provincial data sets um, and two international databases. We always use one from the US and one from the UK as additional comparators because Canada, while we have 35, we have 35 million people, is not that big. Um, in total, our, our data work, the data we work with are uh, over 100 million people. And we have typical claims data for most people. We have some uh, additional data on, on some data sets. Uh, this is just a schematic of the data sets again. Um, the only thing that's worth noting here is we have cancer registry data in some sites, but not in all sites. So the, the strengths of CNOTES are sophisticated analytic methods where we're, we're because we're working in a, a slightly less structured environment, we can develop and use whatever methods we want on our problems. We have a strong data infrastructure. The Canadian administrative claims data are long-standing, established, very solid databases, and a widely distributed research network. Um, I'll skip along this, most of these, other than to say this last one here is relevant to today's conversation. We've reduced uncertainty about the risk-benefit balance. This is the, the typical product, and you saw lots of these in, in Darren's uh, presentation already. The typical product is, this is comparing high-potency high statins versus low-potency statins. Um, this is two subgroups, diabetes within two years of therapy or, or within a 120 days of therapy. This, this is the, these are the provinces or the sites. The summary estimate is here. The summary estimate for this one is here. You'll note, as Darren did, that there is some evidence here of heterogeneity. The, 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 the results are not lined up straight over the, the point estimate. So this is what we're talking about uh, today. So how does CNOS try to minimize heterogeneity? We have our, our protocol developed and then approved by every site, approved by I run the methodology team, so there's always a methodologist on the study who will look it over for methodological rigor. Uh, we always have someone clinical or pharmacological who knows something about the content we're studying on each team as well. And we make sure that it's feasible, that it's scientifically valid, and that there's sufficient power to, to run the study. Then, and I'm going to focus most of the talk today on this, after the protocol is written, uh, we write a very detailed statistical analysis plan, which is a very detailed protocol down to, in many cases, specific SAS code that is sent out to the sites um, and then distributed across the sites. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this iterative, iterative and analytic process where we're trying to ensure reproducibility and minimize heterogeneity but avoid contamination. And then we do meta-analysis and outlier checking at the end. Um, The analysis plan, I won't go through this in detail, it's a step-by-step -step guide that sets out how the site well, should design, study, and analyze the data. Um, the key parts about it are, are it's created in phases, so the cohorts are constructed and some preliminary analyses are done, and then we sort of do a checkpoint, okay, do things make sense before we go on to the final, oh, sorry, descriptive statistics are run, we do a check there before we go on to the, the main analysis because we want to identify sources of heterogeneity across the sites at this point. And we run the primary analyses, and we run a bunch of sensitivity analyses. So, given that we're running 
the same protocol in eight or ten sites. We do want to minimize heterogeneity across the data analysts. Ideally, we'd like to be able to say, if we had two different analysts and we switched them from one site to the other, we'd get the same answers. So, we do some, as I said, code sharing. We share SAS code across the sites. We share generic fake data so we can run test code across the sites to make sure that we're talking about the same things. We conduct the basic analyses to ensure replication and we, we do analytic reproduction in, in some cases. We will actually double code some, some data if we think there are particular problems. We have frequent contact between analysts. The analysts are allowed to talk to each other. Um, we have a structured review of the results. Importantly though, the analysts are blinded to each other's results so that we don't have the opposite of, of heterogeneity. We don't have somebody saying, well, Darren's site got a hot odds ratio of 3.0 and he's from Harvard, so he must be right. I'm going to try to move my odds ratio over to 3.0. We don't want that to happen. We want everybody to do their best to get the right answer for theirs, not to figure out what, the, what other people are doing. Okay, here's a couple of examples I'll quickly go through. This was a study of incretin drugs versus sulfonylureas in pancreatic cancer, and you see kind of right away there's really no heterogeneity. This is good news. The I squared, in fact, for the meta-analysis was zero, saying there really is no heterogeneity in this study. So this is an, an example where everything worked. We realized things were fine. Second example, proton pump inhibitors and uh, community-acquired pneumonia. Well. All the sites but one, this one over here, look fine. It looks like it's homogeneous except for one site. So what this led us to do is say, is go back, have somebody else check the analytic codes for Nova Scotia. It turns out they had done everything right. Then have somebody else review the content expertise with Nova Scotia. And find, I found out that PPIs are prescribed completely differently in Nova Scotia than in every other, other province. And that that's the most plausible explanation for why this is, is way Third example, and this, is, this goes back to the heterogeneity at the beginning of the study. What we do when we're doing this in phases is construct the cohorts, look at the rates of exposure, look at the rates of outcome in each cohort, just to make sure that, that those are at least coded plausibly correctly in the same in different sites. And here's an example where sudden cardiac death rate, uh, as derived from administrative data, across Canada, it was 328 per 100,000 person years. But this ranged from, in one province, 192 per 100,000 person years to 900 per 100,000 person years. So it's not plausible that two Canadian provinces might differ by an eight-fold eight uh, difference in, uh, in the risk of an outcome. So in this case, we found this here. We used corrective measures, verifying the coding, make sure they were done the same way in both sites, and recording to go back and, and uh, sort this out. The preventive measures that we use here is this early in study review of the data, of the rates, etc., so that we know in advance, we don't find this out at the end of the study, that there may be something very strange going on. So, some heterogeneity is inevitable. And like Darren said, we're trying to get to the point where if we see heterogeneity in our results, it corresponds to some real heterogeneity that's driven either by patient characteristics or formulary characteristics or something to do with the, the way the drug actually works. Our goal is to, as I've, as I've described, minimize heterogeneity through good practice and checking the data early and often for potential heterogeneity, for sources of heterogeneity, explaining it when it arises and then recognizing the limitations when, when heterogeneity does occur. With that, I'll stop and uh, thanks very much. So we take a little stop out of the North America and the world tours the Europe and also the Asian side. And uh, the following study that I would uh, try to share with you is not from a sort of like formalized network and is all initiated by academics and So this is on my disclosures. So I will talk through the differences in the databases that I have touched on and also some examples of the model database studies. In, mainly in Hong Kong, together with some countries in Europe or in Asia as well. 
So a little bit played back to the databases in healthcare. So in the early 90s, we do have the Medicaid US and the VAMP, which is a previous uh, body of the CPRD in the UK. And in today's situation, we do have a large variety across the world uh, in terms of the healthcare system and the reason for the data collection. Some of the databases have data collected for clinical purposes. Some of them are for administrative purposes, such as the claims one. So because of the data, uh, we did have differences among the database structure. Um, based on that, we could classify them into three major databases. So some of them were the clinical electronic medical records. Among this one, we do have some were hospital-based, such as the clinical data analysis and reporting systems. We call it CDIS in Hong Kong. It's a hospital-based uh, hospital database. And then on the other hand, in the UK, we have the general practice-based databases, uh, the famous CPRD and also the theme. And in the US, in Taiwan and also in Korea, we have the claims database. So the Korea one and the Taiwan one are the national uh, claims record that covers the whole, nearly all the population in that country, where in the US is a little bit heterogeneous. Uh, that's why Also in the Nordic countries, we do have some kinds of national registry. So because of the differences of the nature of data, language between data sources, and uh, the concerns of confidentiality, differences among countries, and also the level of details capturing the database, these all reasons could lead to a different analysis consideration when you do the same study in different sites. So, FDA in 2013, they set up, set up sort of like a guidance in using the databases, which one point is very important is that we have to understand our data before we can use it. So this example is the very first uh, multi-database study that I work on. It's actually by my colleague Sully. She's not here, anyway. Uh, so this study, we work into um, looking to the association between virtual detachment and four criminals. So the whole idea was based on the paper a couple of years ago and then we tried to do something in Asia. So this study includes two Asia uh, databases, one is in Hong Kong and the other one in Taiwan. As I've just mentioned, the Hong Kong database is a hospital-based database and the Taiwan one is a claim database. So the first issue that we experience is the definition of the virtual detachment. So to start with, we used the diagnostic code in two databases. And then we realized that in the claim state, a single patient could get repetitive diagnostic codes because they attend the clinical visit because of that claim state, which is quite different with the hospital database in Hong Kong. Because of that, we fine-tuned the definition of the outcomes. We used the procedure of uh, fixing the retinal detachment to do these studies. But yet, we do have some differences in our results. So the figures is a bit small. Um, so this study we use the self-control case series. So that sort of like uh, uh, within individual comparison. We initially believed that the use of a grid thin individual comparison could further minimize the discrepancy between the databases. But yet, we do have some difference here. Yeah? And then we realized that actually when we break down the um, so types of the four criminals, the use of the medication is quite different between Taiwan and Hong Kong. And that could be one of the reasons that why we end up with a different results. Um, so along this path, we further do a meta-analysis on the observational studies available. And if you have a look on the forest wall on the bottom, so these two studies were also applied the self natural case series study design which end up with a slightly lesser heterogeneity. So, this is another study that we work with using the Hong Kong data and also the CPRB in the UK, looking to the association between four kernels and seizures. So in this study, uh, we also use the self control case series between two sites, but then we discover actually heterogeneity could be also time dependent. When we break down the risk of seizure, uh, lonely single patient um, at different time 
pollen, we find that actually damage the differences in the, in the risk along the, uh, uh, along the risk period. So this could be because of the data capturing um, differences between two databases. Uh, as we're looking into seizure, uh, so most of the seizure cases were handled in the hospital, and the, the CPR data used the GP record, which potentially may have been lacking in reporting the, the results. So that's why there's a strength of the risk path. study that we run a cross-sectional studies, one in Hong Kong and one using the US hospital data, looking into the uh, chronic hepatitis B patients. And one interesting point is that we find that the uh, happy related lab test preference is quite different in Hong Kong and the US. Uh, you may not be able to see here, but then we find that the ALT tests are more commonly used than in Hong Kong. Whereas the HPV DNA tests were more commonly used in the US. So this could be related to the uh, healthcare system in some sense. Because of the Hong Kong data, we are in the public system. Uh, the ALT test is actually only the one covered by the government. And that's why it's more commonly used. And well, in the US, it's claim based. So the, the, the course of the lab test can be covered by the claims. And that's why that ended up with some differences. Last study that I would like to share with you, uh, Nicole goes through this one a little bit in the previous symposium. So this one we solely look at the trends of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder application use across 14 different countries and altogether we have 15 different sites there. So the whole study they cover about 150 million individuals in different databases and we just do a very simple preference trend report. And you can see there's a quite a uh, variety between different sites. And uh, we all expect that we have a higher patterns in the US, but then the third one come along is the Iceland, which is something of our expectation. And then we have the sites down below. And then when we further break down by age, we do see some differences in terms of the uh, age pattern as well. So, uh, if you look, quite small here. If you look at the age group of 17 to 19, the uh, US may not be the highest one. You can see Iceland is catching a very quick look there. So, from these examples, um, we think about where does heterogeneity come from. You should, uh, the data source is, of course, the main. Uh, reason that you can pump up and uh, also the coding system so we use different coding system across different sites and also the differences in clinical practice uh, for example the ADHD one uh, we sort of like share the very similar clinical practice guidelines across the world but then the preference of medication use is quite different across the world and that could also be because of the cultural differences as well uh, for example in Asia especially for Chinese people uh, some of them are very reluctant to have a medication while they think that, okay, I'm good, I could just live without a medication. However, in the US or in the UK, people may be more uh, acceptable to different kinds of medications. So this is the end of my little sharing here and then we will leave it to the discussion.
to provide a platform that to support the conduct of uh, international uh, called AP study, especially for the Asian population. And this is the current effort um, of the ESPEN, and we are really honored and very appreciated that we are getting bigger and receive many, many support to um, do some like uh, ESPEN study. Uh, this is a few milestones, great milestones for the ESPEN. Um, I'm not intending to um, go through too much details here. I want to call your attention on two time points. Number one is um, it's in 2012. Before 2012, we uh, conduct studies very specifically. And um, after 2012, we try to build up an infrastructure that to support the, um, the, the, the conduct of the ESPEN study so that we can have more efficient way, more um, to um, control the quality and the consistency in terms of the study. So we try to, we start to uh, collect the data information from um, each site to uh, about their database so, so that we can more um, understand about each other's database situation. And we execute the SCAN project in 2013, which is mainly focused on conversion of the model. And finally, we uh, complete the conversion of the common data model and we publish the data. We published it um, on the clinical imaging in 2018. And so, if you are interested in um, our uh, this advertisement, sorry, uh, if you are interested in our uh, common data model in uh, Asia, please join us tomorrow morning. We are going, going to give you more detail in terms of our um, um, work for the conversion. Okay, so let's back to the um, the, the heterogeneity for the uh, international study. I'm going to give you an example, which is about the NSAID and the uh, gastrointestinal event. We are uh, uh, we use the data from Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Australia, and Hong Kong for this sort of study. Uh, I think the, the topic is quite simple, as you may know, the uh, GI side effect is quite, it's, it's kind of a well-known side effect for NSAID. But there are two specific drugs that are very specific to our Asian country. Number one is the stop the, the other one is the epidemic acid. And they are commonly used in Asian country and not used for Western countries, so we focus on them. And we choose Bacophenics as the reference. Uh, and the cost is the reference for the cost to the inhibitor, which is a bit um, different in terms of the other mechanics. And we performed a retrospective core study using new user design. I think the, 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 the study design is not very special. We try to use a standard from uh, approach. So we choose the, um, the user of the NSAID and exclude those with life threatening illness. Those with serious upper GI disease that may cause GI bleeding. And we um, performed both S3 and intent to treat um, for this study. Okay. And we, uh, performed, com we performed the common data model approach plus the uh, common SAS program. And as a site participant, as me, it's really like a press the button analysis because someone was really. Right, right up the, the SAS code is by Natasha Chen. Then she, she's, and uh, uh, we already converted our data into common data model so that we can just, when, while we receive the SAS code, we can press the button and run analysis. So this is our result. And I've checked the results based on the literature review, and the result makes sense. The um, instance rate is about like a 30. Um, Per thousand person years in Taiwan here, so I think that that, that, is, that is good. So I re I sent the result to the uh, coordinating center. So at first I saw this analysis analysis is already complete. Actually, the story was just started. While we collect all the results from the Asian uh, country, you will find out there's a huge variation in terms of the findings. As you can find, the rate in Australia is really low. It's only like a 3.2 per thousand person years. 
and there's a very extremely high east rain from Hong Kong. And Japan and Korea is in between, and Taiwan is high. Okay. So we 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 so there's some variations. So we try to check. Uh, we try to figure out why we have this sort of findings. So we check the. This is the current. This is a uh, truncated table uh, for the characteristic of the patient we selected. As you can find out that the uh, um, prevalence rate in terms of the comorbidity in Taiwan is relatively higher in Japan. Okay. And compared with uh, compared between Korea and Taiwan, I think it's quite similar, but. Some were higher in Korea, but some were higher in, 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 in Taiwan. So, there's a variation, right? So, why? I think, number one, the uh, most important thing is the, the nature of the database. Because we use junk that data for um, Taiwan's, uh, for Japan's site. And as you may know, junk that is kind of, kind of um, an employee insurance program. Which means that uh, it covers beneficiaries who were employed. So maybe um, patients in the job that they have so much uh, is healthier and younger, so that they were able to work. Okay. So you will find out the age distribution here. Job job that they have younger. In Korea, uh, we use HILA database, right? But uh, we only have like elderly elderly patients in the HILA database at that time. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the HILA data it only includes elderly patients aged 65 and older. So how about if we adjust age distribution and compare them? So good thing is we have Taiwan's data, you know, Taiwan covers 99.9% .9 of the entire population of Taiwan and we covers all age. So how about we try to uh, try to uh, simulate, try to make Taiwan's distribution like other two um, country? So we do boost scraping. We randomly select patient based on the proportion of each subgroup of age. So you'll find out the age distribution is quite between Japan and Taiwan right now and Korea. So, so let's compare our um, uh, characteristic again. You'll find out the post trapping method is not very helpful to compare uh, uh, in this situation to compare. Um, I, I mean, post trapping is not helpful to deal with this heterogeneity because, as you can see here, there's still big variation between Japan and the Taiwan. Even we at just for age. But Korea, we I think the characteristics are much more similar between Korea and Taiwan, uh, except the psychiatric medication. For example, antipsychotics, you see the rate is really low in Korea, but it's um, about uh, 8.5 in Taiwan. Okay. So there are two points that I would like to emphasize. Number one is as I mentioned, about the nature of the database. Um, as I mentioned, the data is kind of like employee, uh, employee um, insurance program. So, beneficiaries who are employed was included. So, the patients in the job data is healthier and younger. So, that's why they have like a uh, lower rate in terms of the characteristics, in, in terms of the comorbidity. And another thing is about the culture and the behavior. Um, this is one example because Korean people tend to be treat their mental disease through the private in, in insurance, which means that they don't want to be recorded in the national insurance. So we might uh, underestimate the actual use of the um, psychiatric drug. And I think the most important things I would like to emphasize is Different countries may have different principles to get treated, to, to get hospitalized. So, uh, for example, in Taiwan, you know, we, we have like a mandatory national um, insurance program, and which um, and the the medical costs quite cheap, and 
know, you know, Taiwan is really small and many, many hospitals it is, so it's very, very convenient for them to have a health care. So that's probably why uh, we have like a high rate of the, um, the, of the gastrointestinal event because people are very easy to get treated. Yeah. Another example is from Australia. Um, as we you know, it's, hospitalization cost is really expensive in Australia. So, yeah, I mentioned by the, um, uh, Nicole also told me that people, you know, um, get hospitalized unless they are very sick or even almost to be, to die. So now, or they will not get um, hospitalized. Is that right? <laughs> okay. So let's move to the um, the survival analysis. We uh, we performed cost proportional health model, and I just want to call your attention on this one. This is the cost, which is first uh, cost to selectives and states, which means uh, because of theor theoretically, um, because of the mechanism of action, the psychosis should have like lower GI risk, right? But you will find out that the risk was higher in Taiwan. So let's reflect the, 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 the situation, the very specific situation in Taiwan based on based on our reimbursed timeline, uh, uh, patient required to have these uh, six conditions so that they have they can uh, get reimbursement for the use of the silicosis. For example, the patient who uh, or osteoarthritis aged 60 years or years and above, and those who need long-term uh, use of NSAID, or those who need a uh, concomitant use for steroid, and those who had a history of of, of um, GI um, slight, uh, GI bleeding and GI upset, and those who concomitantly use for an uh, anticoagulant. Well, which means that uh, this patient has like a high baseline mix of GIV. So that's probably why we observe a uh, high risk in 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 the cellulosic group in Taiwan. So here, I just want to emphasize the uh, we need to do we need to differentiate. We need to figure out uh, what is the heterogeneity, what is bias in the study, and I think active comparator and use is helpful, but it's just for within the country comparisons. Um, and for the cross country comparison, we need to think more about this. And I think the, the biggest um, advantage, biggest um, things um, for um, implementation of this study, this study holds a number of lessons for the future of um, in, uh, international pharmacal AP study. So, if you are the editor, you receive this sort of a study, will you accept it for publishing? Okay. So, I think this is my last slide. Um, I mean, we want to point out five um, questions for you to, for the, the following um, panel discussion. The number one is, um, detection of the variation of course, uh, course size is, is important, right? But how? How can we detect the variation? And differential bias of the study and the heterogeneity, the cross size, how can we differentiate them? And how to deal with the bias and the heterogeneity? And when should we aggregate the result from site? And how? So, I think that's my name is Esmeralas, and I've been invited to uh, uh, go chair this session together with uh, Suho. Um, and it's my role to summarize what has been said and to lead the discussion afterwards. Um, I think uh, Suho framed the discussion very well to begin with. Um, there are sources of heterogeneity, um, for example, the biological, and we should expect biological heterogeneity particularly when we study diverse populations. There's nothing wrong with that that uh, sort of heterogeneity should be presented and explained. It doesn't have to be genetic. For example, we heard of different rates of GI problems with NSAIDs. It could be explained by different uh, prevalences of helicobacter infections. You know, the bacteria that 
causes peptic ulcer. Um, then we have uh, one what we call contextual um, variability that is legitimate. Um, lots of examples. Um, the relative risk itself is contextual. It's the contribution of the drug-induced disease on top of a, a, a level of baseline disease. And if that baseline disease varies, you will see uh, heterogeneity in the relative risk measures. Confounding itself is also contextual. What is confounders in one population need not be confounders in another. Um, that, uh, of course, is also completely legitimate that we would see different results. Um, bias is contextual. For example, if you have misclassification, we know that self-control designs can be extremely sensitive to misclassification, and that may uh, explain um, differences across uh, data sources if there's not the same granularity of data position in them. Then we have the sort of heterogeneity that we really don't want to see, um, namely the contextual heterogeneity that is not legitimate. Um, I've been involved with a project uh, at Harvard where they're trying to reproduce uh, a lot of database driven studies using actually the same um, data sources and the same protocol as the original investigators uh, reported. And the results are, uh, to say, mildly disturbing. Sometimes you see a variation in the size of the cohort by an order of magnitude, say, nine times higher or larger cohort uh, when they reproduce the study. Um, and they see uh, wide differences in, um, in the relative risk estimates. Um, some of this is uh, explained by lack of transparency in the protocols. Um, for example, um, they have approached the authors and whenever there's a lack of clarity, ask them to, uh, to uh, clarify, uh, but they have few, uh, received very few responses. And uh, that alone may explain a lot of heterogeneity. We don't want to see that kind of heterogeneity. The other is uh, uh, simple analytic or programming errors. We don't want to see those either. So um, there's lots of sources of heterogeneity. The contextual but legitimate um, heterogeneity, I think Robert gave a very beautiful example with the association um, that was threefold stronger in, was it Manitoba, between PBI and Pneumonius. It was not a coding error, it was not a programming error, it was a different type of um, drug utilization in a particular province that generated this result. The result itself was correct and it was not replaced by a different uh, result in the population, apparently. So, um, this kind of heterogeneity should be understood and it should be presented as well. I think that's all that I have to say in my summarizing. If I missed something, please, please correct me. And I'll ask the, uh, the contributors to step up. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask uh, clarifying questions before we start the panel discussion? Something that was unclear or something they want to object to? That doesn't seem to be the case. We have uh, ample time, so let's um, ask the panel some of the questions. Um, question one was, detect the variation uh, across sites. Is that important? Uh, I assume all of you agree that it is, but how should we do it? Um, and I think I'll ask Darren first. We mentioned the problem that uh, when you have such large, large data that you have our common tests for always be statistically significant. So how do we deal with it? Yes, it's a good point. I don't have an answer to that. Um, so I think heterogeneity is important for the general reviewers. Um, we don't always agree with that. Uh, because
as uh, sometimes you do what you did is expected, like uh, you said, Jasper. Uh, but, um, but it's hard to um, make a case one way or another sometimes because um, if you use sort of quote unquote um, a more objective measure, which is uh, statistical test, which uh, for the most part, uh, if I understood correctly, was uh, developed mostly in clinical trial settings. Uh, so we are applying the statistical, statistical methods of what test one homogeneity um, developed in meta analysis of, of RCTs into the type of work that we do. Um, uh, so I would argue that um, um, sometimes heterogeneity is good uh, and uh, is expected, uh, and uh, the most fundamental thing that we could do is to present an overall estimate um, and the database specific estimate. Um, I had a conversation with a biostatistician, so this is a term that I would call to the others who help. Um, she argued that um, if your causal question is uh, framed in, in a different way or in a very specific way, um, you have a pretty strong argument to just pull the data together and present an overall estimate without having to present site-specific estimate. Um, I don't fully understand the argument, so maybe the audience in the, uh, here will know, or maybe uh, the panelists will know, but there is another argument to say that even though there is heterogeneity, it might still be okay. Depending on the cause of question of interest. Any comments? Ben? No, I was going to say, I don't think I can answer Darren's question right now. I think I. I always would like to see, even if the, the overall estimate is the one you're interpreting, I think you'd like to see what's going on between the sites, just even if it's just for qualitative understanding of heterogeneity. And I, I, I agree, I think I agree with Darren that sometimes maybe there's an overemphasis on heterogeneity between the sites in our study because in, in Canada the populations shouldn't be that different between one province and the next one. They're, this, they're this, the same country, the same socioeconomic status, uh, this, the same behaviors, so, but we should expect some random variation between the centers. I think trying to decide how much to do with it, I mean, I cited an obvious case where there was clearly something wrong, but when you see sort of heterogeneity that looks like noise, I probably would be relatively unconcerned about it. The fact that uh, you are not asked to provide all site-specific uh, estimates and, and like to do it would be related to that you have nine sites, 19 sites, and you have seven. Yeah. Um, Just a comment, maybe a little bit more question, because we talked about how to detect variations, right? And you mentioned about the size of the data and kind of a feedback being always kind of pos uh, positive in terms of uh, that, even with the small differences. But I think that's when we consider what's clinically meaningful. And then, I mean, looking at your example, there are some examples that you had maybe a hazard ratio or rate ratio of one versus like two. And then that confidence in, in interval might not or might overlap. But to me, that one to two seems to be clinically relevant. But do you have any sort of standardized approach to when you say that this is clinically meaningful? <laughs> Standardized approaches, ask the clinician. <laughs> and if he or she says it looks weird, then it's weird. <laughs> but I, I, I think, I mean, I, I, agree with, I agree with what you just said. I would say if the, the p value for heterogeneity is 0 0.04, but the clinicians who are looking at it and saying that looks kind of like noise, then it's fine. If the, if the heterogeneity statistic is not significant, but there's something weird going on, I'd like to. I have a small question for the 
So we are not hiding anything in our studies. Um, every estimate that we, we have done in the study were presented. Um, of course, the interpretation is highly dependent on the readers. But we would like to provide more, as much information as possible so that you can uh, make your own interpretation out of the results. I wouldn't say that uh, every study should provide a pool estimate, but we, as long as we can do that, I guess we should present that as well. Whether it is clinical relevant or that's appropriate, it's up to your interpretation. I think we've started uh, answering questions in the Q4. When should we aggregate the results from sites? Or almost when should we aggregate the results from sites? Um, I think that a question is easier to answer. So, uh, any bit from. Can I have a question? So my question is about uh, the data transformation standardization. So we heard from uh, uh, Darun, uh, the Sentinel, common data model, and uh, uh, Robert didn't use the, uh, any common data model, and also we have a OMA model. So I, my question is to, uh, to Robert. So what are your considerations, you know, uh, so why why Canada uh, prefers to use original data instead of uh, transformed data? And also, uh, your recommendation, you know, in China, we have many uh, EMR data. So what do you, you know, recommend? Which kind of common data model you know, China to use? So that's a, a couple of great questions. Um, first of all, I should, probably should have said at the beginning, um, the Canadian databases, so there's one, the databases are structured by province, but they're very similar from province to province. They, they, their administrative insurance health claims, the coding systems are pretty much the same across the province as ICD-9 and ICD-10 are used. Sometimes just slightly different times when they switched over, but they're, they're already almost like a common data model. Um, so, Initially, we thought there was not a need to develop a common data model within Canada. Subsequently, um, we've had some pressure from Health Canada to be able to provide some more rapid response uh, answers to queries like, and Darren referenced this earlier, like what's the risk of this outcome just across the population or how many people are using this drug across the population. And so we're implementing the Sentinel common data model so that we can use the automated tools for rapid response to, to simple queries right away. We're still probably, for our more complex queries, going to use our, our more traditional analyses, but again, our data, our, our structures are not that different across the sites. I think and this could be a, a, a topic for a much broader discussion, your second question. Um, if I think of the, the Sentinel common data model as one option and the OMOP common data model as another option. It seems to me like they're, they're both fit for different purposes. That the Sentinel one, first of all, maintains the data structure as much as possible. It allows these rapid responses. It works well when the data structures that you have are relatively homogeneous. I say relatively homogeneous. They're maybe not as homogeneous as the Canadian data, but still relatively homogeneous. Darren's feedback on this too. Whereas OMOP, that's more of a, a mapping common data model uh, that uh, channels information more is perhaps more useful when you're dealing with very heterogeneous databases. So if you're dealing with, and I know OMOP does work with, say, one claims database, one hospital based EMR, and a different kind of database all in the same problem, in that case, and the Aspen experience, I think where you've got heterogeneous databases. In that setting, the OMOP common data model is probably your best choice because you're mapping to a standardized language. You can map different things to a standardized language, whereas if your data are not that different, it makes sense to preserve the maximum granularity in the data set. Uh, yeah, I got the point. You know, if it's, uh, that, you know, it's more heterogeneous, probably, you know, OMOP model is a more preferred one. I also like to know if we use um, um, like a sentinel, is that the sentinel transformation take less effort? Uh, 
Well, we have we are doing the Sentinel transformation now, and um, we haven't done the OMAP one yet. So I'll tell you. I can tell you next year maybe how long it takes. Uh, my guess is that the Sentinel transformation takes less upfront effort because it's not not as much modification to the to the underlying structure, whereas OMOP is really converting a data set to a new structure. But that's a guess. I haven't done it yet. So. I think Edward made a comment about the OMOP transformation. One thing I want to emphasize, like, I think whatever is done on OMOP common error model or Sentinel's common error model is good. But to convert the data structure, it relatively easier. I think the most challenging part is to convert the content which meet the terminology code, especially for Asian country, because we have many, many like, unique um, drug product like Chinese herbal medicine. There is no international like, code. So, so that we, we cannot, because there is no international code, so we, we, we cannot convert the, the code to the, to, to the way. So, so I think that is the biggest problem we, we have made. The, not just for Chinese herbal medicine, there are also some like, very unique product which is only used in Taiwan. And we, um, we, we have to do like a manual mapping for each single, uh, which, for each um, product for that. <coughs> yeah, so we require a lot, a lot of discussion and we took about like 18 months, 18 months to convert the data from a native database to so, so the ASPIN common data model is a kind of a unique Asian version of a common data model, which would be appropriate for this region. I mean that the common data model you mentioned right now in ASPIN is that uh, more of a appropriate to you know? We compare it to it. Oma. 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 Yes. Oma. Yes. Oma. Yeah, sorry. It's slightly modified, but it's, it's OMA. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, so, as when you talk about the Sentinel Common Data Model. Um, so, I, I tend to think of the Sentinel Common Data Model as Lego, uh, in that you have different colors, you sort of standardize the different colors, and then for a given analysis, you can put it together. Uh, using the pieces. Um, so it is not pre-assembled in a way that um, you create some sort of a uh, sort of definition that you use for every study. Um, it allows you the flexibility. So um, as Robert alluded to, uh, we talk to clinicians all the time. If you talk to 10 clinicians about how to define diabetes, they'll give you 20 definitions. Um, so that's why we want to preserve that type of flexibility. And, and that's why, like Robbie said, Sentinel's common data model is to preserve that at the most granular level. So that you can put the pieces together to create what you want for a given study. So that is the flexibility. Uh, um, on top of that flexibility is a common structure that everyone will follow. Um, so I think that different common data models, so the two most commonly used ones are the Sentinel and the OMAP common data model. Uh, like Robert said, I agree, they are created for different purposes. I don't actually have a strong feeling, one way or another, for which one should be used for the Asian country. Um, I think that um, it depends on the needs and, and, and the preference uh, for the most part. Sentinel's common data model can also be used um, to standardize ES1 if you want to. It's not only for claims, it's also uh, created to be flexible enough to accommodate uh, ESR and registry. Um, you don't see that because FDA has not asked us to do that. Um, the day the FDA asks us to do that, we will have that. And if you look at the Sentinel Common Data Model, you will see some EHR elements or type tables there. Um, so, um, so I think that both Common Data Models are flexible enough to accommodate different data structures and different data sources. Um, there's one question. Yeah. 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 Questions? Speak up, please. Uh, I'm Shao Fenzer from Pfizer, New York. Um, the question is for Dr. Lei and Dr. Uh, May. Um, SB has used the uh, common data model. I wonder if we can share 
whether the, uh, the studies using um, the uh, complex model have been just for the purpose of research or they have been accepted by regulators. Um, what is the, uh, your view of the acceptance by the regulators using, uh, for the studies using complex model in Asian region? So on to regulators, uh, sadly we didn't really work with the regulators in our context. Uh, uh, more detail will be given tomorrow, uh, this aspect is a network of academics and uh, all the active members in our network are from different universities across the Asian Pacific countries. So we do not really have a very intense relationship working with uh, regulators. And also, there is no single regulators across Asia. So different countries, different regions may have different regulators, where they may have different uh, view on, on observational study in particular. So that is um, a, a, a unique area that we have barely touched on at the moment. So that's the issue. Um, then if you talk about the common data model that we have converted, um, I would say we are able to harmonize the data structure, but we may not be able to harmonize the information that we contain in the database. In particular, the, the, the way of contact is quite different across different sites. And also we do have some unique items in our in different database. So while, uh, during the conversion, um, of course, we do not have a hundred percent map, and in some of our sites, we do need to add some extra categories. Let's say the combination portal, uh, the drop portal, that will not exist in the all common data model that we're using, and then we have to ask them to add a few new uh, categories for us, so that we can improve the mapping. Uh, I think you point out very important um, what the mission of the ASPEL. Uh, we try to, but before we, um, have a, we, go, we uh, contact with the government, we, we think uh, we need to um, control, I mean, control, we need to improve the quality of the, the, the multinational studies, so we still um, spend our efforts to do that. And hopefully, we have. More like a trustworthy and trustable um, data in the future so that we can have more connection with the government. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the floor? I think we have time for just a brief response. Uh, when should we aggregate results from sites? Give us some example when we should be first. If it were bigger, I think we would prefer to have 
some kind of protocol driven, even if it's a qualitative protocol driven, but protocol driven method to say if we observe this, then we'll exclude a site or we'll, or something like that. So we've done that in subsequent studies. One, one that we haven't published yet, but it's coming. Uh, we, we decided one site post hoc based on, on sort of structural criteria like that one didn't belong in the study and excluded. So uh, I'm expanding on my comment that I didn't understand from my past decision. It's all about your research question, right? So let's say Sentinel is mostly insurance claims data. And if your causal question is that, what is the effect of certain medication on the outcome in the commercially uh, insured population? That means uh, you can justify pooling together all the databases, even though they might be heterogeneity. Because your causal question is in that population. Um, so if you want to take, a, take it a step further, we do study all the time with a very wide age range from 18 to 95 years old. You can also argue that, uh, uh, what if there is uh, treatment heterogeneity by age? Um, you don't look for it, but um, you should look for it because if the effect is, uh, it, it, it sort of varies by age, then you should not. Uh, present overall result, you should present the result by age. So, to me, data source is a, an obvious and easy thing to think about when it, when, when it comes to treatment effect heterogeneity, because there are all the other reasons that could introduce heterogeneity. But if you are confident that the data quality are of sufficient quality, um, and then the analysis is done in the same way, so um, then database is just another stratifier like age. So, and now the argument is it's just an easy target for you to say, okay, they might be heterogeneous, but you can argue the same thing for age, for sex, or even the age-sex combination. It's just that we don't look for it. Um, it doesn't mean that there's no treatment effect, uh, effect heterogeneity. So I'm getting more philosophical here, but I'm just saying that heterogeneity um, by data source um, is sometimes just an easy target for people to cri criticize multinational studies. So, as Soko and Yes Bernardo said, Sentinel actually has it easy because our data sources are actually pretty homogenized. Um, we don't actually get the same type of uh, challenges that Ken and, and Edward uh, or even Robert uh, are facing. Uh, but even us are, are, are getting questions about heterogeneity. I can only imagine uh, what their life are, lives are when they, when they submit a uh, something for publication or just to share with other people. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to, we're going to conclude. I just wanted to make one comment. I agree with you're a statistician. If your question is the population average effect, and then that's the population you're interested in, you can um, aggregate the results, but only if you exclude the sources of heterogeneity that is kind of artificial, maybe coming from data conversion or kind of bias or other